Good morning. Welcome to Cross Point this morning, whether you're gathering with us in person, in the dark, or on video of some sort, we are glad that you could join us this morning. Unfortunately, Pastor Harold cannot be with us this morning. He has a migraine this morning and is not able to lead the service, so uh, in his place, uh, Mr. Jake Fayen will be leading us in worship this morning. Before we start, I'd just like to highlight one thing that is new today. Uh, as you're leaving, beside the exit door, there's a sign-up table. Uh, that was introduced to those who were here on Friday night, but uh, that will be up there uh, again today and probably for a week or two in the future as well. Opportunities to sign up for various areas of service where you can help. But the one that we really like to emphasize today is a Bible study that we're going to be starting in two weeks. We have a six-part series on the Heidelberg Catechism, a summary, and we are encouraging everyone to sign up. We have opportunities to gather in small groups on Sunday nights, Wednesday night, or uh, during the daytime in the week. And the, the process will be that Pastor Harold will be leading a service on Sunday on the theme that we will be studying that week. So we really like to encourage everyone to sign up for that. It'll be starting in two weeks, but um, if you can sign up today so that we can order the right number of um, books that you can study along, that would be great. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do so today. Thank you.
when I found out that uh, they may need me to do this, I thought of a number of things. And the one thing was, I wasn't going to change anything in the order of worship. The only thing that's going to really change is the sermon. But we need to do a few other items, and we'll be doing that, and I'll be using one song, just the lyrics, out of the Psalter hymnal. And stanza two, this song is titled, I Am the Lord Your God. It was written about, well, it was actually written in 1985 by a lady that's a member of our denomination. And stanza two says this, sing praise to God the Lord, gathering his people, bringing them in from all parts of the earth. Blind, lame, and weak, he will lead all together, gently exchanging their weeping for mirth. And as a greeting, I am the Lord your God, you are my people. I am your savior, preserver, and rock. I am your God, keeping watch like a shepherd, caring for Israel, my people, my flock. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can gather, called by you, to bring praise to you, to bring our prayers, and to listen to your word. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we may bring this worship in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God, let's sing. Being real with God. Let's start that, being real with God, by singing stanzas one and two of Not What My Hands Have Done. <clears throat>
As an assurance of pardon, I'd like to share with you Luke 23, starting at 39. Those of you familiar with Luke 23, it's the story of Jesus' death on the cross. And verse 39 says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal replied and rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the same can be said for us if we turn to Jesus. Then when the time comes and his kingdom comes, we can be with him in paradise. Stanza three. join me in the bold parts, I will do the first parts. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who mis misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder.
you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. I will love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it, and I will do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's business. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. With all my heart, I will always hate sin and take pleasure in whatever is right. Our song of response is Refiner's Fire. At this time, we have the opportunity to bless the Lord through financial giving. Normally, we have two offerings or collections every Sunday morning, but today we have three. We, the first one is going to be for the work of a cross-community church, Classes Ontario Southwest, and the CRC in North America. The second is for Edu Deo. It's an organization that supports staff in Christian schools with curriculum and all sorts of other situations to make it in such a way that children can receive a Christ-centered education. And the third one that the deacons have asked for us to support, and there's a basket for that as well on the table out in the uh, foyer or the room out there, and that is to support Red Cross Fiona Relief for our friends and neighbors and possibly family in the Atlantic provinces. I understand that the Canadian government is matching funds with whatever is raised through the Red Cross to support those people. Shall we pray for a moment? Heavenly Father, you are in control of everything. Yes, even hurricanes. There is devastation. There is death, but there is also hope. 
And we ask you, Lord, that we may be able to share in spreading that hope, in supporting the ministry of the Red Cross to our friends, neighbors, and relatives in Atlantic Canada. And as we also think of supporting them, we also remember the devastation, destruction, and death that has gone to our neighboring country to the south through the state of Florida and now in the Carolinas and coming north. And later today, we will probably feel effects of that Hurricane Ian. We ask you, Lord, that you will be with each and every one that is working to assist and restore the situation that happened or that was there before these two hurricanes. And we ask you to be with the individuals that have lost so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we will sing, Hear Our Prayer, O Lord, and then Robin will lead us in prayers for the community, and we will close that time with Hear Our Prayer, O Lord, again. Thank you, Robin. Green button's good. Good. Let me lead you in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we come into this place from many different walks of life. Uh, we come here seeking you, or maybe because we have to or we're told to. But we pray that while we're in this place, we're able to feel your Holy Spirit and that you're able to um, help us grow in our faith and to be able to build up one another. We thank you for the world that we live in. We thank you for the different things that we experience of your blessings all around us. Hear our prayers as we come to you now with things from um, our own hearts as we share them in our community. Amen. Are there any requests of things that you want to bring to God for items of concern or praise uh, for our world? We'll do it as a, a global thing first. Ukraine? Let's pray for the Ukraine. Heavenly Father, we bring the people of the Ukraine to you and their country, which is being torn apart by war. We pray that um, you will work mightily there to bring peace and restoration, that you'll preserve life, and that you'll bring hope to a people that's being oppressed. We pray that you will work mightily in that land. In Jesus' name, amen. Other things? Other places? and rest in Afghanistan. Heavenly Father, we bring the country of Afghanistan to you. It's a country that has been so torn by factions of people struggling for power there, and um, there's so much oppression, so much devastation, so much destruction. And we pray again for your peace to come in that country, um, for people to have freedom, for people to have uh, a purpose, and um, a future without war. We pray for peace for Afghanistan. Amen. Tina? Yes. So we'll pray for um, some of the hurricanes that have been rocking our world. Um, there's many different ones that have hit, um, and so we will pray universally for the people that are affected by that. 
Heavenly Father, we think of all those that are experiencing the natural disasters of hurricanes and the aftermath of that. Uh, we pray that you will protect people, that you'll give them safety and shelter, um, that relief will come quickly, and that there will be a refuge for them. Um, when your life is in danger, sometimes material possessions don't matter as much. And yet, um, we pray that these people will have their needs met and that um, those of us who have more can send money, can offer time, can offer um, our abilities to help rebuild the world after these things have happened. Amen. Barb. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So Barb mentioned that there's so many volunteers that are giving of their own time and um, sometimes putting themselves in, in jeopardy, um, risking their own safety to help others that are in need. So we'll pray for volunteers around the world. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for those that are willing to go and to help in many troubled spots. We think of those that are volunteering that you will keep them safe that you'll keep them healthy, and that they can um, bring some of your love and peace into um, areas where it's so desperately needed. Um, thank you for those that are willing to go. Amen. All right, let's pray for our country, for Canada. Are there things on your mind that you can think of, um, items of praise or concerns for our own country? for our freedom. Well, thanks. thank for God for our freedom, for sure. Heavenly Father, we live in a beautiful country. We're, thank, we're thankful for Canada, and we're thankful for the freedom, the freedom to worship, the freedom to get up in the morning and do our own things, um, that we don't have to fear oppression or um, uh, being chosen to be um, persecuted for our faith because we're different. We thank you for that freedom that we have here in Canada. Um, it's a beautiful thing, and it's a privileged thing. So we do thank you for that. Amen. Other things about Canada? Susanna? Yes, okay. So Susanna reminds us of the truth and reconciliation process that was happening the day that marked that on Friday. Um, where people wore orange shirts, where there was um, a lot of uh, good conversations that happened, a lot of hurt that was still expressed, and hopefully um, there's healing that comes from that. So we will pray for that as well. Heavenly Father, the, uh, the way that people have treated other people hurts you more than anybody else. And we um, stand before you knowing that even if we were not directly involved, we are still somewhat responsible. And in that, we ask for your forgiveness on behalf of our country, on, on behalf of the leaders that made decisions years ago that affected um, other people and treated them less worthy than themselves. We pray for healing for um, all the Aboriginal people that have suffered for the fractured families, for the lack of um, culture, for the suppression of their languages and their um, ability to, um, to be part of a family. We pray that your peace will come and that um, healing will be brought into our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray for our town, for Tilsonburg things that you uh, are concerned about for our own town here. All right, Jake mentioned the elections that are coming up. Heavenly Father, in about a month, we will be um, electing new local governments and people to help um, lead our town and um, our townships. We pray that your will will be done there too, that the right people will be in leadership to make good and wise decisions for our town so it can flourish. 
we pray that um, they will be able to hear what your will is for this town and that this can be a place where you are glorified and where your kingdom grows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Other things about Tilsonburg? Yes. Linda reminds us of the homeless with winter coming. Um, it's a big concern. Let's bring that to God. Heavenly Father, many of us that are here have good homes. We have food to eat every day. We don't have to wonder where it's going to come from. But there are many that don't have that. And we have those people here in our town that need our help. Um, they don't have a home. They don't have a warm bed to sleep in. They may not have warm clothes. And they probably don't have enough food. We pray that we can be generous, um, both with our resources um, and with our friendship to help people that might be in a difficult time in their life. We pray that you will help us see the need and be willing to reach out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Other things for Tilsonburg? I'll, um, I'll mention those that are struggling with addictions. It goes a lot with people that are homeless, but not all homeless are addicted. Um, but addictions wreck families and uh, make things really difficult. Um, so we'll pray for those that, have, that are struggling with addictions in our local area here. Heavenly Father, you made us wonderful. Our bodies are amazing, but they're also sometimes broken. And we pray for those that struggle with addictions. We pray for the way that that affects their own bodies, but also how that affects their families. It breaks relationships. It hurts people. And um, we pray for those that struggle, struggle with addictions to alcohol or to other substances, that um, you will bring healing for them as well. Amen. All right, personal things within our congregation, things um, that are important to you, things that you're concerned about, things that you want to bring as items of joy or thanksgiving. Yes. All right. It isn't a laughing matter. Um, as most of you know, uh, my husband is struggling with uh, migraine, and uh, migraines are not a laughing matter. I agree with that, but he does need healing, so we'll pray for him. Heavenly Father, thank you for Pastor Harold and for the work he does here in this church. We pray that you will work um, to bring healing to his head and that he will be free from pain. Um, migraines are something that some of us struggle with, and we understand. Others have never experienced one, and so can't really relate. But um, we pray for healing, not only for him, but also for all those that do struggle with, uh, with that severe pain that comes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Other things? Yes, Jake. Okay. Yes. Yes. I will. So Charta had her baby this week, and um, all is well from what I understand. Um, so I'll pray for the um, Nick and Charta and their family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of new life. It's pretty amazing. And um, the way that babies grow and then are born, um, and join a family is, is just an amazing thing. We thank you for Nick and Charta's daughter, Raven, and we thank you for her place in their family and in our community. We thank you for the gift of life and for um, everything to have gone well. Um, we pray for them as they raise all four of their children. In Jesus' name, amen. Anything else? Susanna? We'll pray for those that are still expecting. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are expecting babies, that you will keep them healthy and let those children develop well um, as they grow inside their moms. 
we thank you for um, the gift of pregnancy and uh, the answer to prayer that that is for many people. We also pray for those that um, might be unexpectedly pregnant and that you will watch over those children as well and that um, those parents will know that that child has a life and a purpose and is part of your good and glorious plan. Thank you so much for the gift of life. And as we conclude this time of prayer, Lord, we thank you that we can share and that we can be a community together, that we can pray and that we can bring things to you because you are all-powerful and all-knowing and um, you stand there ready to hear each one of us. Thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we get ready to hear from God, let's sing, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. The word that we'll, we will be turning to as the children from grade, age three to grade four go to Sunday school is Romans 12, one to eight, and 1 Corinthians 12, one through to 31. As a call came in late yesterday, there was nothing on the order of worship in regards to what the sermon was going to be other than a scripture reference. And I didn't want to duplicate anything that Pastor Harold had prepared, and I trust he will share that with us at a later date. But I'm mindful of what we went through Friday night. Friday night we had quite a few of you here, and 
Arnold reminded us of some of the things that Paul sent, said to the Romans out of chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 31 reiterates that and our text will be verse 11 out of that portion. So Romans 12, starting with verse 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so, we in, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in, accord in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then from 1 Corinthians. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't, do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And this is our text. And he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, <coughs> sec second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So far the reading. The title of this sermon is Discover Your Gifts. This sermon was prepared by Reverend Jack Cortell. For those of you that are not familiar with how the Christian Reformed Church operates in regards to leading worship, but in particular having sermons, that a lay person such as myself should read a sermon that has been prepared by a minister of the Word. So these are not my words, these are the words of Reverend Jack Cortell. Interestingly enough, he served in the Christian Reformed churches in our particular area from Ottawa down to almost Windsor and north and south. And he's, to the best of my knowledge, still living. And he's over 90. But having said that, this sermon that he prepared, I believe will speak to us in many different ways, to each one of us. He starts this way. A number of years ago, Pierre Burton wrote a little book entitled The Comfortable Pew. He severely criticized the members of the church for sitting back to receive without getting up to give. He predicted that this would be the death of the church. And though Pierre Burton is no theologian, he was right about the future of any church where ministry is left to those who are supposed to be experts. Of course, it is tempting to sit back, to take it easy, to let others do the work. The result, however, is devastating. First of all, to the church, because there is more work than a few so-called experts can handle. But also for those who think they can sit back and watch, Non-involvement means dying for both the church and those members who, unlike Jesus, seek to be ministered unto rather than to minister. The comfortable pew means that the burdens of the ministry are left for the shoulders of a few, and it will result in quick burnout. It will result in, sometimes, severe criticism on the part of those who do nothing, and that will bring more discouragement to hard workers. And one more result may be that those who stand back and live on the edge of the church are always in danger of falling over the edge and losing it all. But the Bible has news for us. Being a member of the church means that you and I, according to our ability, take part in the ministry of the church. No one is accepted, not even those who think there is nothing they have to contribute. Every church member has been given at least one gift. 
So what we need to do is to discover our gifts. These gifts are one, body, two, spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, Paul, writing about the Spirit-giving gifts, says he distributes them to each one, each one of us. And that gift is a body gift. By that he means that these gifts are given to the body of Jesus for the work of the church. It is important for us to think about the fact that together all members form the body of Jesus. And of that body, Jesus is the head. What does that imply? When Jesus was with us here on earth, he finished the work that he came to do. He opened the way to the Father, the way home. He removed the terrible roadblock formed by our sin. That, however, did not mean that nothing remained to be done. For instance, there are children who need to be informed that the way home is open. They need an invitation to come back to the Father. They need to be guided. Furthermore, all God's children need to be prepared for living at home. They need that simply because they know naturally how to live in this God-forsaken world, but they have to learn anew how to live in the home with their Father. They need to be integrated into the body. They need to learn about fellowship and many other aspects of living with and for God. They need to learn how to live in the kingdom. They need to learn how to assist in the coming of that kingdom. So Jesus, when he had to return to heaven, from there to rule his church, sent us the Holy Spirit in his place. The Spirit came to live in our hearts, to transform us, to sanctify us for living at home. By his very nature, he remains in the background. He works behind the scenes. There he encourages us to do the work of Jesus, to finish what is still left uncompleted, gathering all the nations in, calling all to give God the glory, uniting into the body of Jesus. We need to think about that for a moment. If we are his body, and if he completes what he began, but through us, that means unless we, the church members, do the work, it will not get done. It means that if Jesus wants to speak to the world, we are his mouth. We have to do the speaking. We are the voice of Jesus if we obey and listen to him. No one can hear Jesus except through us. If Jesus wishes to go into the world, there, where his lost children are, we are his feet. Jesus only goes there through us. And if he wishes to touch anyone in blessing, he will do so only through the touch of our hands. That is that is what it means to be his body. The one task the church has is to finish the work of salvation, to prepare the world for his return, to get everyone ready for the great climax when the earth and the heavens will be renewed and united. Everything we do is geared towards that end, the production of food, transportation, working with computers, everything we do must be to the glory of God, that is, to get his work done. Even recreation is never an end in itself, but a means to gain new energy to continue to serve him in all that we do. Anything else is a waste of time, or worse, it could even oppose the completion of the work and the return of Jesus. If we then are the body of Jesus, 
it must be helpful to think for a moment how God made the human body because Jesus' body functions just like it. What happens when even one small part of our body malfunctions? Let us say that we have a hurting, infected small toe. That is surely not the end of the world. But what will it do? First of all, it drains us. It takes time and energy to fight and overcome the infection. We cannot let it go, lest it spreads. We have to go and see the doctor. We probably will have to go to the drugstore. We may have to bathe that toe. Such things are really a bit of a nuisance because they take us away from the things we would rather do, things that are more important. Furthermore, an infected little toe can be very painful. It may make walking difficult. It may, if the pain is severe, make concentrating difficult, sleeping impossible. All in all, it is a pain to have even an, an infected little toe, let alone that we str struggle with kidney, liver, or heart problems. That is what happens in the church. When one small member does not function, it interferes with the task of the body. When one small member is infected and needs time and attention, it drains the church of energy and makes it difficult to get on with her calling. If that same member begins to cause pain, when that member becomes critical, when he gets into spiritual trouble, you can just imagine what that will do in a church. Such a member drains energy, siphons it from doing the work of God to itself. Pew warmers, those who seek only their own comfort, those who contribute little or nothing, those will, who fail to give according to their ability, are the cause of a church that is often sick, weak, and unable to do much for the Lord. Sometimes we may wonder why people in church are not more happy, why there are financial strains, why it is difficult to get people to teach or lead. In short, why it is, why it is such a struggle. It is because part of the body fails to cooperate, to give, to share, and instead drains the church of resources and energy. The body that is totally healthy, the body where all parts function as they should and are doing what they are made to do, is a healthy body. Only the church where everyone gives as he or she has been given can be productive, a growing and a happy church, for the gifts we have been given are body gifts gifts to be fully used for and through the body of Jesus. The next thing we want to notice is that these gifts are spiritual. That means, first of all, as Paul again says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, that these gifts are given by the Spirit. Each member, no matter who he or she is, has a minimum of one gift. Often people have more than one gift. These gifts, therefore, are spiritual. They come from heaven. They are also spiritual as distinct from natural. Only the two are very closely related. Let us say that there is a young man who is naturally gifted in sports. He's a superb hockey player, for instance. That is a natural gift. Not all that different from a spiritual gift in that this gift is also heavenly. This young man holds his gift via creation. The God who made him, the spirit who was involved in creation, gave him that special gift. Not everyone has it. A spiritual gift differs from a natural one in that it is used through the church for God. Let us say someone has a way with little children or young people. That sometimes quite naturally leads to becoming a good teacher. That gift may be used in Christian education or church education. 
It may be used to lead children to the Lord, to strengthen them in their faith, or beyond that, in shaping them and their gifts in the service of God. That is a spiritual gift. So how do you then discover what your gift or gifts received from the Holy Spirit really are? There are a number of things that will point the way. First, there are things you enjoy doing. You enjoy them because you are good at them. And you are good at them more than likely because that is a gift, a spiritual gift. Secondly, you may discover that there is something that you can do better than most people, probably because that is a gift of the Spirit. And a third thing is the confirmation of others. People are generally critical. But when someone does an excellent job, there are always people who will tell you that. They will show amazement, surprise, gratitude for what you have done, probably because that is a gift. But some spiritual gifts are slumbering. That is to say, we are not aware of them. Again, we may have the gift of teaching, but we were never in the position of testing ourselves, so we remain unaware of it. In that case, there are seminars or workshops that will help you discover these slumbering, still hidden gifts. That is necessary, of course. Hidden talents must be discovered, for the Church has a dire need of them. We need to mention also the difference between the more ordinary gifts we have spoken about and the sensational ones that Paul mentions here. There is the gift of tongues, of healing, of miracles. Especially the last two are much desired, simply because you can make a powerful impression when you miraculously heal other people. It is sensational compared to, for instance, the gift of serving, helping behind the scenes, largely unnoticed. We need to say, first of all, that the Bible nowhere tells us that these gifts have ceased. As a matter of fact, they never ceased. If they are not very noticeable, that may be due to spiritual decline of the Church. But it also needs to be said that these spectacular gifts are not always the most important. In the case of Jesus and the early Church, they demonstrated that the claim of God's almighty, loving power was not just a matter of words. Miracles and healing demonstrated that God's love and power are real, but a healing is always temporary. People healed through a spiritual gift of healing always get sick again, and certainly they die like everyone else. Paul himself urges the Corinthians to seek the more important gifts, like teaching, serving, giving. As a matter of fact, Paul strongly emphasizes that the most excellent gift is love. To love is not always easy, but to the gift to do that is a transforming gift. Agape love is not only the gift to love the unlovable, but often it is the love that transforms those who are not very lovable into loving people. What all this means is simply this. The discovery and development and use of our gifts is of the greatest importance. Just think of a congregation where everyone is using some gift. Think of a council which does not appoint people to do something merely because it needs to be done and there is no one else to do it. But such a council appoints people to do the things they are gifted to do. That would be one happy church. Little or no burnout. Burnout happens when people are asked to do what they are not gifted to do. Paying attention to people's gifts is paying attention to the leading of the Spirit. It means to be open to His blessing and power. A church where every member is giving according to gift and ability 
is a church that will grow, both spiritually and in numbers. So let us, if we have not done so already, discover what our gifts are. Let us recognize these gifts, the blessing of the Spirit. Let us encourage one another to develop, to develop these gifts, and then let us put them to full use. Blessed is the church that welcomes gifts from God and then returns them in their use to him for his glory. Amen. Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be part of a church where leaders are asking us to come together, to encourage one another, to serve one another, and to learn from one another. We thank you for the various functions within our church, GEMS, cadets, youth. We also thank you for the studies that some that have already been going for some eight to nine weeks where people have gathered studying discipleship. Also for those that are mentoring one another in discipleship and those that have, after learning about discipleship, have begun to recognize that discovering the gifts that we have is a very important part of church life. And we ask you, Lord, that we as a church may grow and be happy serving you, being your feet, your hands, and your mouth in whose name we pray, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Lead me, guide me. Let's sing.
as a blessing. Stanza three of I am the Lord your God. God will establish us, keeping his covenant, which will extend to each nation and race. God's law will dwell in the hearts of his people. We will be blessed with his favor and grace. Amen. Great are you, Lord. Thank you.